Hi, uh, this is Erica G. I'm an attorney at Wright Lindsay and Jennings, and we're Heartland Cannabis Lawyers as well. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Happy Sunday evening. I'm happy to see you all here with us. Um, I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about some questions that you ought to be thinking about and questions you ought to ask your lawyer um, if you are interested in getting into the cannabis industry in Oklahoma. Um, we'll start off with a few questions that um, I've talked to several of you out there already about. And then we have some questions that were sent in earlier from some of our um, audience members, some people who are going to be watching us tonight. If you have a question, please drop it below and we'll do our best to get to it before we finish up this live, live video. And I hope you'll all bear with us. We um, have not ever done a Facebook Live video before, so we're, we're charting new territory here, and hopefully you can actually hear me and see me. That's probably uh, step one. <laughs> all right, so first of all, let's talk about some questions you ought to be asking your lawyer if you're thinking about getting into this business. Uh, your first question is, and I'm sure a lot of you out there are asking this now because of um, the, what the Board of Health has done with the rules and then the lawsuits that were filed on Friday about the rules makes it all seem so uncertain. A lot of you are thinking, and you should talk to your lawyer, about how can I plan for and open a business when the rules are constantly changing. I mean, it seems so uncertain, it seems so unpredictable, and that is a question that you should be giving a lot of thought to right now if you're interested in this business. Number two, how can I structure my business to attract and keep the right kind of investors? Um, I'm sure if you've looked into this at all, you're recognizing that this is a business that requires a lot of capital. And even if you have money, you'll probably need some more, or some of you will. And uh, you need to think about how you structure your business so that people who have the money and have the capital to go into business with you will be attracted to work with you. Number three, um, how can I meet the needs of the patient community? And I really suggest to all of you that um, you pay a lot of attention to the pain, a lot of attention to the patient community. They're your customers. They are the people whose needs you need to meet if you're going to be able to stay in business. So how can you do that and make enough money that you can keep the lights on? And then number four, um, what you should ask your lawyer is how can I comply with Section 280E of the Federal Tax Code and maximize the business deductions, deductions that are available to me, but not go to jail. So for answers to those questions, if you don't have an attorney to ask, uh, you can come to our seminar in Tulsa. It's this coming Wednesday from one to five at the OSU Tulsa campus. Me and some of my colleagues, a multidisciplinary team of attorneys who are experienced in cannabis issues, we're going to be presenting this seminar. We'll answer those questions and a lot more. Um, if you are interested in checking out that seminar, you can click on the link above. It will take you to the page where you can find out more about it and get tickets. Um, I think we have some questions that people have sent in a little bit earlier. Ricky, do we have some questions? We do. Um, the first one is, what is the rule if I have out-of-state investment? Great question. Um, I know a lot of you, especially those looking for investors, are thinking very seriously about that. The rule is, um, under 788, 75% of the ownership of your business has to be by uh, Oklahoma residents. 25% can be from out of state. And so there are some different ways that you can structure your business to try to accommodate that, but that's the rule that you should keep in mind as you're speaking to investors. All right, um, the next one, can I hold multiple commercial licenses? You can, and this is one of the things that is really a great opportunity for people in Oklahoma because you can, there's no limit on the number of licenses that an entity or an individual can hold for these businesses. So it gives you the option to, for example, have a chain of dispensaries um, where you can go ahead and build your brand from the very beginning or you could um, have a grow operation, a processing facility, and a dispensary and vertically, vertically integrate that and manage your costs. 
um, a little bit better and you can actually put all three of those in the same building. All right, we have another question. What is the impact of a felony on my record if I want to own a cannabis business? Well, um, so I want to be clear from the beginning here. The impact of your, your criminal history is different for patients than it is from business owners. So if you're a patient, your criminal history does not affect your ability to get a patient license. But if you want to open a business, it does. And the rule is that you can have no felony convictions at all within the last two years. You can have no violent felony <clears throat> convictions at all within the last five years and you cannot be on supervised or unsupervised probation um, for a previous felony conviction at the time that you submit your application. And maybe it's obvious, but it's also this, I should say, if you are in jail, you cannot apply for a license. Got it. <laughs> All right, another question is, what changes if things go recreational and how will that affect my business? That's a great question, and I think that that is something that a lot of people are thinking about, especially with all the renewed activity around the petition to go recreational. Um, I think the best way to keep it in mind is many states who started with medical and went recreational still have both systems in place. Um, you can plan to keep your medical side of the business and then also have a recreational side if that becomes available. I mean, certainly that's how they would do it and um, that's how they do it in Colorado. You have one side of your building is recreational and one side of your building is medical. And um, I think we could expect that there would be um, some differences for medical patients. Maybe you'd be able to have higher dosage, dosages in the products that medical patients could buy or would have a lower tax or some other types of um, differences that would make it uh, more advantageous for a medical patient than recreational. Got it. All right, one more. Uh, what is the preferred legal structure of a cannabis-based business? Uh, this is a great question because I think a lot of people who have had any experience in business are familiar with um, an LLC, a limited liability company, and all things being equal, when they started up their cannabis business, they would make it an LLC. That is not a good idea. <laughs> and the reason for that is uh, what I mentioned a little bit earlier um, at the beginning of this about Section 280E of the Federal Tax Code. And we won't do a deep dive on this right now, but let's just suffice it to say <clears throat> that because of the way that Section 280E works and because of the way that different types of corporate entities are taxed, our recommendation would be to um, establish a C corporation. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions right now. Okay. So we could hang out for just a minute and see if we get any more. <laughs> Ricky, do you have any questions? I don't, not at the moment. Okay. I just want everyone to come see us in Tulsa on Wednesday. All right. Well, if you do have questions and this live broadcast is over, uh, feel free to uh, message or ask your questions on our Facebook page, Heartland Cannabis Lawyers. We are Wright Lindsay and Jennings, Heartland, Heartland Cannabis Lawyers, and we will get back to you. Oh wait, I think we have a question. We do. Okay, we do. With a grower's license, will you be allowed to extract the cannabis oil to sell to a cannabis processor? The extraction is done under a processing license. So if you want to be a grower and what you want to sell <coughs> is um, the extract that's already done, you could do that, but you'd need to get both licenses. All right, um, and one question, will you be coming to Oklahoma City for a seminar? I think probably so. Um, we're looking at that, we're, we're gauging people's interest. Um, I was in Oklahoma City with the Oklahoma Cannabis Business Alliance last week was that last week it seems like a long time ago but I think it was last week and uh, I, I uh, we've gotten a lot of questions from people from Oklahoma City so we're, we'll certainly try to make that happen if there's enough interest in it all right thanks so much for joining us um, and hope to see you on Wednesday <laughs>